Okay, hi. So in this video, we're going to talk about the harbour process. Now, the first question, of course, is what is the harbour process? And the harbour process is basically making ammonia. So this is the process we use to make ammonia. I did actually cover the equation for this process in my last video. So you might be familiar with it already. But the basic equation for the harbour process is nitrogen plus hydrogen makes, now notice it's reversible, ammonia, which is NH3. All of these are gases. And in order to balance, well, we need three and two. Okay. Now, the first obvious question really, though, is why bother? Why do we hear about this process quite a lot, especially in science? What is so great about it? Well, plants need nitrogen, just like we need nitrogen, but we can obtain it when we eat. Plants don't eat. What they do is they photosynthesize and produce carbohydrates, but carbohydrates do not contain nitrogen. They still need nitrogen in order to make their proteins and in order to grow properly. Okay, that's a slight crossover to biology. But ammonia uh, is, a, is obviously containing nitrogen, but a better way for plants to take in nitrogen is through their roots in the form of nitrates. Nitrates, okay? And ammonia can be used to produce nitrates. And so therefore, making ammonia as a starting point is a very good idea. Also, a quick one, why do they need this extra nitrogen at all? Because plants in the wild clearly grow. Well, that's because plants in the wild, they die. And when they die, their remains are left over, they decompose, and the nitrogen in those plants are returned back to the soil. However, when we farm crops, when we take them out of the ground and we send them off to be eaten or, or to be grown somewhere else, obviously the soil is not going to um, get the nitrogen back from those plants, because those plants do not die and decompose where they are. So the soil is not getting nitrogen, it's not cycling the nitrogen through the natural process of death and decomposition. So we need to come up with another way of getting nitrogen to the plants in order for them to grow again and again so we can keep growing plants, and that is by adding nitrates. Okay, right, so this process is called the Harbour process because it was invented by a man called Fritz Harbour, and it's still the process used today to obtain um, a lot of ammonia. All right, so sorry, let's go the other way, there we go. Now, in this process, we use nitrogen, nitrogen and hydrogen. Now, nitrogen is the main component of the air. It makes up about 78% of the air. And so we just get that from the air. The hydrogen, well, we need to get that uh, from somewhere. It doesn't, it doesn't make up, sorry, a lot of the air. So we get it mainly from natural gas. Okay, but that natural gas also contains other things such as methane. Now, both of them need to be purified because we need only nitrogen and hydrogen in this process. Any impurities and we'll get other reactions which can mess things up. Now, this reaction is carried out uh, in very specific conditions. We have a high temperature. So, high temperature. We're looking at around about 400 to 450 degrees Celsius. Okay, high pressure, you're looking at 200 atmospheres. That's basically 200 times atmospheric pressure. And we need a catalyst. And that catalyst is iron. Okay, so it's an iron catalyst. I'll just put in Fe there, which is the chemical symbol for iron. Now, because this reaction is reversible, it means that you'll reach an equilibrium. But this isn't really good enough because we want to produce as much ammonia as we can. So what we do is we carry on taking the ammonia out. Now, I mentioned this in the previous video, so if you aren't familiar with um, how we change conditions to alter an equilibrium, please do have a look at that video before carrying on. But what we're going to do is we're going to keep removing ammonia so that the nitrogen and the hydrogen have a chance to react over and over and over and over again. And therefore, we can get as much ammonia as possible. The way we do that is that ammonia has a higher melting and boiling point than nitrogen and hydrogen. So at a certain temperature, nit uh, nitrogen and hydrogen will be a gas, but ammonia will turn into a liquid. So if we reduce the temperature enough, 
then ammonia will turn into a liquid, okay, or condense, whereas nitrogen and hydrogen won't, they will still be gases. So we liquefy and remove. Once it's a liquid, it's easy to remove from the nitrogen and hydrogen because they're still gases. Then what we do is we recycle the nitrogen and the hydrogen and allow them to react again. Okay, there is a diagram um, showing the reaction in your books. It shows where you have the nitrogen and the hydrogen mixed, and then they pass on to a reaction chamber containing the iron. Then they're passed to a cooling chamber so we can get rid of the ammonia, and then it happens over and over again. I'm not going to draw that out because it is basically just as I've just said. But if you want to see the diagram and you prefer that, then do have a look at that in your books. Okay, so I'm going to move on now to the economics of the harbour process. And this is um, more specifically describing how we choose the reaction conditions. Okay, so I'm going to put a title here. Reaction conditions. And this is all higher tier stuff. So if you are taking the foundation tier, then please do feel free to stop the video and skip on to the next one now. But first of all, we're going to talk about pressure. So the pressure. For this, you do have to have watched my previous videos on the chemical equilibria. If you haven't seen that, then please do have a look first. So I'm going to rewrite the equation. There you go. Three hydrogens reversibly makes two ammonias. Okay, these are all gases. Gas, gas gas. Sorry, that's messy. There we go. Now, you'll remember then that the amount of molecules or moles on either side of the equation tells you what pressure is going to do to the reaction. Okay, It's going to tell you where the equilibrium is going to go. So, for example, we've got four on this side. So, let's say four moles in total because one nitrogen and three hydrogen to every two moles of product, okay? That means that there is a higher pressure on the left-hand side than there is on the right-hand side. This means whatever we do to the pressure, the equilibrium is going to want to reduce that change. Therefore, if we increase the pressure, that means the equilibrium is going to move in order to reduce the change. So I'm gonna write increase pressure Equilibrium, EQ, moves to the right, okay? Because if we move to the right, that is going to decrease the pressure. So the equilibrium will move to reduce the change. Well, that's great because we want to produce as much ammonia as possible. So why don't we just make the pressure as high as we can humanly get it? Well, two reasons. Because one, it's very expensive. Because in order to have very, very high pressures, you need a really, really strong reaction container in order to have that happen. Also, because we're using nitrogen and hydrogen gas, if you were do using extreme pressures, any slight problem and you're going to have a huge explosion. Okay, so for cost and safety, there must be a compromise. Need a compromise. That compromise is 200 atmosphere pressure because that pressure is still high enough that we're going to get a, a good yield of ammonia. We're not going to get as much as if we had, let's say, 1,000 atmospheres or 10,000 atmospheres, but having those sorts of pressures costs a lot of money and it's also very unsafe when you get really high. So this is the compromise we make so that we can get as much ammonia as possible as cheap as we possibly can. Okay. Now, next, we're going to have a look at the temperature. Now, this is a slightly more complicated scenario. So, here's the equation again. And you can see above the forward arrow, I've written exo. And um, below the backwards arrow, I've written endo. That's because the forward reaction, when we produce ammonia, is exothermic. And the backwards reaction is endothermic. Okay, now this provides a problem. Because, let's say, for example, we want to produce as much ammonia as we can. Remember, the equilibrium will move to reduce any change. So if temperature is increased, equilibrium moves 
to reduce that change, which is to the left. Because remember, an endothermic reaction will take in heat and decrease the temperature. So if we carry out this reaction at really high temperatures, the amount of ammonia that we produce is going to go down because we're going to move the equilibrium to the left. So why don't we just carry this reaction out really cold, as cold as we can get it? Well, that's because, remember, temperature is completely related to the rate of a reaction. So temperature is proportional to rate of reaction. So as you increase the temperature, the rate goes up. Because we need a lot of ammonia and we need it fast, because this is obviously an industrial process, it's no, it's no good having a good yield but waiting around for five years in order to produce it. We need to get the ammonia as quick as possible. And so this is a scenario where we come up with a compromise. So the compromise is 450-ish degrees Celsius. This is a high enough temperature for the rate to be um, fast, so we get a lot of ammonia very quickly. Even higher temperatures would get us the ammonia even quicker. However, if the temperature is really high, we are barely going to produce any ammonia. The yield is going to be really low because we're shifting the equilibrium to the left. So in this case, we accept that we are going to be shifting the equilibrium to the left somewhat, but the trade-off is that we get the ammonia that we do produce very quickly. If we reduce the temperature down to, say, 100 degrees, then yes, we would produce more ammonia, the equilibrium would shift to the right, but it wouldn't happen anywhere near as quickly. So we need to carry this out at a temperature which sort of is in the middle. It's not too expensive to get 450 degrees Celsius, and also it doesn't make it happen really slowly. The rate of a reaction is okay, and we can produce enough ammonia. Now, one last thing I want to mention is the catalyst. Now, you know that a catalyst increases the rate of a reaction. In a reversible reaction, a catalyst will increase the rate of a reaction of the forward and the reverse equally, which means the catalyst does not affect the equilibrium EQ position. Okay, so it doesn't affect the equilibrium position. It doesn't matter what temperature we use the catalyst at. <clears throat> it means that it's not going to play a part in how much product or reactant we're forming. The only thing it does is it tells us how quickly we're going to reach that equilibrium. It's going to tell us how quickly we form the reactants and the products. So increases the rate of the reaction, not the yield. So obviously we're going to use the catalyst because it means that we can achieve our end goal much quicker. We can get as much product as we want in a shorter space of time, but we're not using the catalyst to affect the position of equilibrium. So we don't need to worry about will it increase or decrease the equilibrium, um, sorry, increase or decrease the amount of product formed as a result of the equilibrium shifting. With a catalyst, it's much more simple. All it does is it makes things happen faster. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. If you have got any questions on that, please do feel free to send me a direct email using the link below or post a comment and I'll be sure to get back to you. But as usual, please do like and subscribe because there are more videos coming very soon and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.